Tom Brady hangs him up, this time allegedly for good. Sean Payton has a new home. D'Amico Ryan's, meanwhile, going home. It's been a wild 24 hours in the National Football League. We're going to discuss it all here on this channel. Real quick, though, if you can, check out my video section as I've got a plethora of new videos coming up here soon. Pull up part two, three plus of the mail, sports mailbag. So if you didn't get your question answered, check it out. I will probably answer it in one of those. So I can assure you I'll answer it in one of those. Uh, also, I have a Super Bowl prediction and preview video that will be coming up where I also discuss a storyline that I dropped on Twitter on Monday that's now starting to generate some buzz. Should have done it a lot sooner. But uh, anyway, in the meantime, let's go ahead and get started with this video talking about the last 24 hours of the National Football League. First things first, Tom Brady, greatest of all time, I'm sorry, hanged him up. This time he claims it's for good. Uh, we'll see. And we'll see. But uh, look, what can I say about Brady that hasn't already been said? The man, the greatest of all time. And I know this will piss some people off. They'll argue Joe Montana. I'll tell you why not here in a minute. Why it's Brady above all. Think about this. 89,000 plus passing yards. 649 touchdown passes. A 15-time Pro Bowler. A six-time All-Pro. A member of the All-Decade team for two decades. The 2000s, the two, the 2000s and the 2010s. 10 Super Bowl appearances, 7 Super Bowl wins. That is more than any franchise has ever won. Tom Brady won 7 of them, 6 with New England, 1 with Tampa Bay. This guy did everything. Look, he was so good that Drew Bledsoe has become an afterthought to a lot of people historically. And people don't remember how good Drew Bledsoe was. Man, Bledsoe had over 44,000 passing yards. Bledsoe was a four-time Pro Bowler. Uh, Bledsoe led the Patriots to a Super Bowl appearance. And I know people say that big deal, a, a, an appearance. Well, think about it. Super Bowl uh, spots were few and far between for New England prior to that. The only one prior to Bledsoe and uh, Parcells in 96 was that 85 game that I'm sure no Patriot fan wants to reminisce on. This wasn't a team that had a rich history of success. Bledsoe did good things there, but Brady came in there and uh, he just amplified it to a whole new level. Whole new level. And, uh, you know, he just he was the GOAT. He, and I say this as a Dolphins fan. He was the GOAT. Girls that argue Joe Montana. Well, Montana never lost a Super Bowl. Yeah, he appeared in four. Brady appeared in ten. Of course, you're going to slip up once in a while. All right. I mean, if we're going to cherry pick and nitpick over uh, <laughs> losses in the Super Bowl, I mean, this isn't like they won 0 for 4. They went <laughs> 7 and 3. Come on. Only thing I'm going to say about Brady adverse is he announced he was walking away last year. Should have stayed gone. He lost everything. He lost his family as a result of going back. And look, he had nothing left to prove. Brady had accomplished everything there was to accomplish. Even coming off a great season, he led the league in passing yards in 2021. What else was there to accomplish? All you can do is go downhill from there. And, I mean, even if Father Time did not completely catch up to Brady, you saw signs of slippage this year. And this is from a guy that even Tom Brady in a year where he had slippage threw for over 4,000, almost 4,600 yards, 25 touchdowns. I mean, there are teams in this league that would kiss every ass from here to freaking Tijuana to get that kind of numbers. But for Brady, it was just something was off about him. And we all know, like I said, that the – highly publicized issues that he had with Giselle that led to them getting divorced because he went back. It's just not worth it, man. You've done everything there was to do. You've accomplished everything there is to accomplish. You've won more Super Bowls than any other team. You proved you could do it without Belichick, that you may have been the straw that served to drink, not the other way around. Why well, come back to it? Only Tom Brady knows the answer to that, but he is apparently done for now. And I tip my cap to him as a Dolphins fan. I mean, real recognizes real. He was the greatest. And I can't wait to see that Hall of Fame class, man. That Hall of Fame class in a few years, it's going to be he, it's going to be J.J. Watt, who also hung him up this year. That's going to be a sickening class. Anyway, moving on, Sean Payton. Some argue maybe a Hall of Famer when his coaching career is said and done. He has a new job, and this is no surprise to me. He's going to Denver. Now, I did a video on here previously where I talked about what coaches could go where. 
And Peyton to Denver was, a, to me, a lock because they were the only one that could meet every single demand of both the Saints and of Peyton financially. Money's one thing. Some of these teams were weirded off by the money. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, Michael Bidwell was very iffy about giving $100 million to a head coach, $100 million plus. Um, you know, Indianapolis, Bob Ursay, or excuse me, Jim Ursay, Bob Ursay, no Baltimore fan wants to listen to this. Jim Ursay was very reluctant to give out that kind of coin. Houston, they weren't too crazy about giving up that kind of money. Now, Carolina would have, David Tepper would have dropped $100 million in a heartbeat, $120 million. You know, he would have wrote a blank check. If he gave Matt Rule $60 million, he would have certainly given Sean Payton, who not only has won a Super Bowl and been one of the more successful coaches over the last 20 years, uh, but knows that division well. He would have given him the bag, too. But the part two of that segment is there were teams that weren't giving up those draft picks that they had. Denver has a very low first rounder that is the San Francisco 49ers by way of the Miami Dolphins. For those that want the, the path of that pick, that's now in New Orleans. Uh, started out with San Francisco. They traded it to Miami as part of the Trey Lance deal. Uh, the deal to move up to get Trey Lance, I should say. And then Miami traded it to Denver to get Bradley Chubb at the trade deadline this year. That's now going to New Orleans. They don't give a shit about that. I mean, it's a low 20s to a 29, 28, 29. They, that's that's nothing to the Broncos. They could care less. If that's what they have to cough up to get a coach, then they, they were willing to do so, and they did. They gave up a first, a second next year, and I think a third next year as well. Um, money, look, the Waltons, they don't give a crap. Drop the bag. Blank check. They don't, you know, so it just made the most sense. Now, he's going to have his work cut out for him. I said of all the jobs that were available, Denver is the most difficult to me because, number one, they don't have much cap space. Number two, they only had that small draft pick. Now they don't have that, you know, so they don't exactly have a draft pick to build upon. They're coming off a disastrous year. Their first round pick originally is headed to Seattle and is a top five one. Uh, they're in a monster conference, too. This is not going to get any easier. That AFC West is nasty. Patrick Mahomes ain't going anywhere. Justin Herbert ain't going anywhere. Okay, that's what they're going to have to face every year. And eventually the Raiders are going to get their shit together. They seem like they finally got it together last year. Uh, before they made the block-headed, stupid-ass decision to uh, not give Rich Basicchia the full-time job and instead go with Josh McDaniels, who was a abjunct failure before. I don't know what everybody thought was going to change this time around. Um, but eventually, you think the Raiders are going to turn around. The pieces are there. They're not that far off, so he's going to have his work cut out for him. And the big thing that's going to dictate his coaching tenure in a mile-high city is whether or not Russell Wilson is still Russell Wilson. She's shown signs the last two years. In the last year in Seattle, slipped. Slipped big. This year, the wheels fell off the damn bus. But for Denver, it was too late because they had paid a huge fortune to get him, both in draft capital and in uh, cap space. Did not look good at all. Now, I know some people will claim, well, that was Nathaniel Hackett, a terrible coaching hire. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to sit here and patty cake that that was good by them, by them. I mean, Hackett was one of the worst head coaches I've ever seen. I'm not going to say he's the worst, but he was certainly up there. Didn't even last a full season before getting fired, and it's because nothing because nothing due to what he did off the field. He was a class act off of it. He just was not equipped to be a head coach. But I ponder, though, how much of Russell Wilson's decline this year and his shitty performance has to do with Hackett? You can only give so much of the blame to him. Russell Wilson's not some young kid, guys. He's 34 years old. This is a guy who is well-established as an elite quarterback. Even if Hackett wasn't it, which he clearly wasn't, the elite quarterbacks can adapt to any coach. And it's not like he didn't have the tools there, the pieces to throw the football to. This wasn't an expansion team. This wasn't a team that was built to tank. They were built to win. Wilson was supposed to be the next step. So if Wilson is done, that's a huge salary cap hit that they can't get out from under. This could be interesting. This could be very interesting. I know Peyton got the bag. And that may be, may be his biggest priority, but, man, it's, not, it's going to be tough. It is going to be very tough for him. Uh, D'Amico Ryans headed back to Houston. He was a multi-time pro bowler there, one of the most popular players during some of the golden days of Texans football, a real fan favorite. Uh, got advocated by, by a, a, an authority no less than J.J. Watt himself. He's a new head coach of the Texans, six-year deal. 
And I'm going to tell you, this fan base, I was in a Twitter space yesterday. They are rejuvenated. They are at, they're over the moon. These people were as excited as I've seen them be in a quite a few years. And this was the right move. They had to do it. They had to do something to appease this fan base. Because, call it as it is, last three years have been very rough. Bill O'Brien's final year there was horrifying. I mean, we saw all started. The beginning and the end was when they traded Nook Hopkins for David Johnson and, and a draft pick. Um, then, you know, you saw the stories about how bad things were behind the scenes with Jack Easterby and Cal McNair, the back-to-back one-and-done head coaches that, you know, were both African-American and absolutely just looked like shit for an organizational standpoint. Um, you know, especially after they were hit with a lawsuit by Brian Flores and are mentioned in the lawsuit by Brian Flores for racist practices. I mean, there's just been so much garbage that has gone on at this franchise. Deshaun Watson being all that nonsense and the ultimate subsequent trade. But I think this is the beginning, a new beginning for Houston. I like Ryans as a coach a lot. I love this hire for them. I think he is a bright mind defensively. He took over a good defense in San Francisco. Robert Salah didn't exactly leave the cupboards bare. But what Ryans did was took it to another level. Uh, and there was a lot of people that said Ryan certainly worked hand-in-hand hand with Salah to build a, you know, a, a dynamite defense in San Francisco. That he was very much a, a responsible party, too. This guy could potentially be an, an elite head coach. And him going home to tax at Houston, uh, a place that knows him well, the fans love him, I think it's a great move for Houston. I think, like I said, the light is at the end of the tunnel for him. They've got that number two overall pick. They did not cough it up, and I don't think they should cough it up to move one spot to get Bryce Young either. Okay? Do not move that 12th pick. You've got two potential studs. Whatever quarterback you get, if it's C.J. Stroud uh, or if somehow, somehow the Bears wind up standing pat and taking a Will Anderson or, or Carter from Georgia, then you've got you know, Bryce Young falling into your lap. You got yourselves a, you're going to get yourselves a franchise quarterback in this year's draft. And at 12, I said, look, C.J. Stroud and Jackson Smith and the Jig was not the worst duo I've ever seen. I think that would be smart. Well, Jordan Addison wouldn't suck there either. Just saying. So light certainly at the end of the tunnel for Texans fans, and they, they deserve it. They've had a dumpster fire of a few years. Anyway, that'll wrap it up for this video. Thank you very much for tuning in. Again, be sure to check out my mailbags along with uh, my Super Bowl preview, which will be coming up here shortly. We'll talk soon. My name is JP, and if you're not, you can't be victorious if you're not notorious. Good day.